Hi there and welcome to Lecture 6 for Biostats. So today we're, um, we're looking at hypothesis tests. We started this in Lecture 5. We'll look into it in a little bit more detail. Um, we'll talk a little bit about p-values and um, why in some cases are not a particularly good measure or at least um, there's a few dangers um, when using them. Um, we'll look at what the assumptions are behind a hypothesis test um, and then we'll um, move on to uh, linear modelling. So you remember with the petrol stator we had, uh, we noted that there was a difference in size between the sexes and we can see this on most of the measures. Um, there's a difference in the right wing length, there's a difference in the left wing length, the left tarsus length, the right tarsus length, and so on. And it's a consistent differences, difference in that males are larger on average than female birds. And uh, we showed that we could uh, test this formally um, to see whether you know what we saw in our sample might exist also in the population uh, by using the t.test function in our studio um, to test whether there's a difference between in, in the average right wing length between the sexes. And um, there's two ways to assess this. One is with the confidence interval and the other is with a, with a hypothesis test. So with the confidence interval, you can see that the 95% confidence interval here is for the difference females minus males. So first group, the one on the left here, minus males. So you can see that 385.26 minus 388.44 is going to be, you know, about 3.2, near enough. Uh, minus 3.2, right, because it's a small number divided by, uh, minus a larger number. And thus the reason that there's negatives on this confidence interval. So we can be 95% confident that, um, that the difference is between 1.2 and 5.1 units, and that males are larger than females because both of these numbers are negatives. And zero isn't, in the, isn't a possibility, right? So the difference is somewhere between um, males are either between 1.2 and 5.1 units larger than females, and so zero difference isn't in that interval, so we can conclude, can conclude that there's a difference. So the confidence interval allows you to say whether there is a difference and also allows you to, to find how large it is. Okay, so that's what a confidence interval does. Uh, the hypothesis test approaches it from a different way, so what it does is it says, well, let's, let's imagine that in the population there's no difference between male and female birds. Um, then when we take a sample of birds, um, every now and then we will see a difference, right? Just due to sample to sample variation. And so what the hypothesis test does is it simply um, estimates directly what's the chance of observing the difference we saw in our sample just due to the sample to sample variation, just due to the sampling process, um, what's the probability of that happening? And that's the p-value. So the p-value is, given there's no diff difference at all in the population, what's the chance of observing a difference in a sample of this size? Okay, so when the p-value is small, you're saying that, well, the chance of observing a difference in our sample is really low. We observed a difference in our sample, so our sample must be extreme compared to what we'd expect if the hypothesis was true, right? So if your data is extreme compared to what the hypothesis is, then it's inconsistent with that hypothesis, okay? Therefore, there's sort of evidence against it, if you like. That's what the p-value is doing. So small p-values provide evidence against a hypothesis of no difference. Our data are inconsistent with there being no difference in the population. Okay, so this pretty much sums it up, really. And the key is that if the p-value is small then it's unlikely our, our, um, our, our data have arisen from um, a population of no difference so there's evidence against it. And if the p-value is large then your data is consistent with what could arise by chance and therefore um, you know is providing some support to the hypothesis of no difference. So confidence interval and hypothesis test um, essentially approach the same question from different angles. So with the confidence interval you're trying to find um, a range of plausible population values that are consistent with, that your data are consistent with whereas in a hypothesis test you're trying to say well just how inconsistent is my data kind of put a put a precise quantity on that on that measure which is the p value now when you've got the p value you, um, right we have this decision back here of you know if it's small we do one thing and if it's large we do another right so if it's small, our data are inconsistent, and if it's large, our data are consistent. So the obvious question is how small, right? Like, is there a threshold that we should choose between these two options? And the answer is, is that uh, you can use a threshold, but it's a really dumb idea, okay? 
So um, many uh, scientists tend to use 0 0.05 as the cutoff, which sort of corresponds to the 95% uh, confidence interval. Um, but it's generally a bad idea, okay? And um, the reason that it's a bad idea is because the p-value that you get from a particular sample is quite a noisy measure. So if you collect a different sample, then your p-value will be similar to the one you got, but um, but the similarity might not be too large, right? So if you if you get a p-value from one sample and it's like, you know, maybe it's 0 0.03, right? And so, you know, maybe you think that that's small enough, and so you're saying your data is your sample is inconsistent with the hypothesis. The next sample you take, though, might have p as 0 0.07. And now maybe you'll be saying, well, actually 7% happens reasonably frequently. Our data are sort of consistent with the hypothesis, right? So the p-value jumps around quite a bit from sample to sample. It's quite a noisy measure. And if you sort of um, put a hard threshold in, then you're taking that noisy measure of, you know, sometimes it'll be 0 0.03, sometimes it'll be 0 0.07, maybe it'll be 0 0.04 or 0 0.08, you know, it's going to jump around a bit, and you're, you're sort of um, converting that to an even noisier measure, which is less than 0 0.05, bigger than 0 0.05, right? So um, provides evidence against, provides evidence for, um, which, is, which is, you know, dichotomizing a noisy measure is a, generally a bad thing to do. Um, and so really what you should do is whether you decide to dichotomize or not, whether you decide to use a threshold or not, you should give the actual p-value so that the readers of your work can decide for themselves as to whether it's small enough, right? So, you know, for you, you know, maybe p is 0 0.01 is, is kind of how small you, you want to be before you um, say that you've got evidence against a hypothesis. But... For me as a reader, maybe I'm actually happy with 0.1, right? Um, and if you provide your p-value, then regardless of what your conclusion is, I can then use it to make my own conclusion, okay? Now the problem specifically with using a threshold is it gives you, a, is it gives a target, right? If you've, if you've got to get below p equals 0 0.05 before you can say something definitive about a hypothesis, then you're going to aim for it, right? Give people a target, they'll hit it. Right, is the idea, and scientists are really, really good at hitting this target. Okay, and they've become really good at it because, um, in many cases, uh, they either feel like they need to have a statistically significant result before they publish, or uh, when they've tried to publish without a statistically significant result, it's um, it's been rejected. So um, the five percent cutoff has has resulted in a bias in the published literature. So. Um, here's a figure here um, from this uh, paper down here, Publication Bias in the Social Sciences, um, which just kind of illustrates this. So um, a null statistical result down here, this bar down the bottom here, is where, um, is where the p-value is large, right? So, you, so your data are consistent with the hypothesis. There's nothing, nothing interesting going on, really, if you like. Um, strong is where you have lots of evidence, so your p-value is small. And mixed is kind of in the, in the middle, right? And so what we'd want is we'd want um, people to publish uh, regardless of, this, of the statistical significance of the study, right? They, we want them to, to publish anyway so that we can um, collect larger da data samples across um, publications. But we see that if the, if the results turn out to be null, so essentially the p-values are large, then you know, almost three quarters of the research is not even written up. So it's not written up as a published work, and almost 90% is, um, so, so a further sort of uh, chunk here is written up but not published. And only a little bit is published and only a, an even smaller amount is published in a, in a really high ranking journal. It changes quite a bit as you go towards stronger and stronger results. So the stronger your results are, the, mu the more likely you are to get published in a, a top quality journal. And similarly, the more likely you are to even write it to, in the beginning, right? So there's a bias for statistical significance in the published literature. And that's not necessarily a good thing because the p-value, as, as I said, is a noisy measure. So some of these strong statistical results will just be due to chance, right? Yet they're published. 
So, um, and you know, the, and if it's due to chance, then it's actually no different to the null result. But, you know, some of them are published and some of them aren't based on that criteria. So it's, um, it's not a particularly good um, criteria to use because as soon as you give it, people a target, they, they, they try and aim for it. And of course, 5% isn't a particularly large target anyway. It's 1 in 20, and um, we expect things that happen 1 in 20 to happen, you know, that sort of thing happens all the time, right? It's a 5% chance of rain today. It rains you know, one in 20 times, right? Um, this is things that happen all the time. And when when um, coupled with the scientific processing, uh, 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 publishing process, um, you get to, you know, the cycle of, of um, um, you know, um, this thing is good for this, or this thing is bad for this. This thing is good for this, this thing is bad for this. And, you, you know, and so um, the same science then gets summarized in the popular media and you get um you know news articles that uh you know um red wine is good for you red wine reduces the chance of cancer red wine increases the chances of cancer right in the next article and potentially leads to um, public distrust in science so here's a great cartoon that that kind of describes this right so we've got this potential, this hypothesis that jelly beans cause acne, right? And the scientists are going off to, to investigate this. And of course they found that in fact there was no there was no link between jelly beans and acne. And so that settles it. But hang on a sec, maybe it's only a certain colour. Right? So they go off and do a bunch of experiments with different coloured jelly beans. Right, and they do many, many experiments, and when you do many, many experiments, right, you're replicating the hypothesis testing framework. If your cutoff is at 0 0.05, then you'd expect one in 20 to find things, even if there was nothing going on, right? And this then, of course, leads to um, dramatic headlines. Okay, 95% confidence that jelly beans that green jelly beans are linked to acne. And this is, you know, I mean, it's it's kind of an absurd situation, but it actually happens reasonably often where, you know, the, um, people will be looking for a main effect of something um, and they won't find it. But then they go looking at subgroups and certain subgroups they find their effect in. And that's the thing that they focus on in their paper, right, when they publish. But in all of the other subgroups, there was nothing going on and perhaps in the subgroup that they found something going on, maybe that was just chance, right? They've tested so many different things that you would expect some of those hypothesis tests to return small p-values just by chance, right? Okay, so that's why the p-value um, is potentially problematic, particularly when you combine it um, with, a, with a threshold for determining when things are important or not. Um, the other kind of um, more general issue is the p-value is, is a bad measure of what you want, right? So in this example here, we have two, um, two examples of diet pills, oomph and precision. So oomph results in an average uh, weight loss of 15 kilos, but it has a large amount of uncertainty associated with it of 6 kilos. Whereas precision results in a smaller average loss of 2 kilos, but has a more uh, a less uncertainty about the about the weight loss, right? And so we have these two diet pills, which would you take if you wanted to lose weight? So if you work out p-values in each of these cases, you find that the p-value for precision is really, really small, right? Less than 0 0.00001, whereas the p-value for oomph is larger. So there seems to be more evidence for an effect of precision over oomph, right? Because the p-value is small. But in fact, oomph is always, is, is generally better, right? So a 95% confidence interval for um, the weight loss that you'd expect to get from oomph would be from 3 to 27 kilos. And the corresponding confidence interval for, for precision is 1 to 3 kilos. So you can see that, you know, the, the upper end of the 95% confidence interval for precision is the lower end of the 95% confidence interval for oomph. 
there is a difference between the two and in fact you're 95% confident that oomph will give between 0.95 kilos so that's 950 grams and 25 kilos more weight loss than precision would so oomph is you know you've got actually quite a lot of confidence that oomph is going to give you a better result yet the p-value for oomph is worse than the p-value for precision and it's because the p-value is just measuring statistical importance but not practical importance right it doesn't incorporate the magnitude of the effect what it incorporates is the magnitude of the effect adjusted for the uncertainty and so if there's not much uncertainty then small magnitude effects can be important but a effect of small magnitude isn't important in a practical sense right i mean losing one kilo is a useful thing losing two kilos is a useful thing but it's nothing compared to losing 10 right so um that's the that's the the idea so the confidence interval should generally pre be preferred over a p-value because the confidence interval tells you how big the effect is right gives you the magnitude of the effect and so in general my advice is to provide confidence intervals um, of how big the effect is and to talk about how big the effect is and why that's important over um, using the p-value because the p-value of course um, kind of confounds the concept of magnitude of effect and uncertainty in the same measure which is not particularly useful okay now there's some assumptions that we make when we do a hypothesis test or a confidence interval and um, and uh, the sort of the standard ones are listed here so we assume that the sample mean or sample proportion is normally distributed notice that I don't say that the sample data are normally distributed right the data can be distributed however they like we don't care the shape of the population doesn't matter uh, what matters is that the means of repeated from repeated sampling or the proportions from repeated sampling they'll be normally distributed and the central limit theorem gives us that right we can just justify that assumption with the central limit theorem as long as our sample size is large enough okay and that's when shape comes into it right so if the shape is nice and symmetric then n can be quite low if the shape is um, very asymmetric so skew to the right skew to the left and in a quite extreme sense then you'll need a larger sample size okay and there's various other rules like for proportions you, you kind of want a decent number of positives and negatives so you want at least five of, of both positives and negatives and that's essentially to take care of the, the skewedness problem okay um, but there's a bunch of other assumptions that we also make that aren't listed here and that is this is kind of assumes um, that we've collected a simple random sample and in many cases of course you won't have collected a simple random sample um, it you know it won't be statistically per perfect so you may have to adjust the sample that you have to compensate for the fact that it, maybe it doesn't look exactly like the population so generally the statistical assumptions are kind of the the least of your problems the biggest problem is the is the uh, is, is that the the sample that you have is probably not a simple random sample and so any uncertainty that you get from your simple random sample will probably have to be inflated a bit um, when it goes to a, a, a sample that's not a simple random sample, right? Because there'll be additional uncertainty and perhaps additional bias in the, in the, in the, um, in the sample that you have. Okay, so that's um, how we do hypothesis tests and, um, and estimation, um, confidence intervals, uh, for simple means and simple proportions. And really, those two cases are, in, are in fact, a special case of more general cases um, where instead of just kind of looking at a single numeric measure um, by, you know, a group, male or female, perhaps you're looking at that single numeric measure across multiple groups, or perhaps you've got multiple measures that could explain that outcome variable. Okay, so, um, for example, with the petrols data, we had both sex and area, right? It'd be useful to know if there's a difference in sex um, once you've accounted for the difference in the areas or is there a difference in the areas once you've accounted for the difference in sex okay with the donkeys data we, we looked at there was a relationship between heart girth and, and body weight right um, so the, 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 the purpose there might be to estimate the body weight and so it's like well if we've got the heart girth maybe we've got some other measures as well we've got the umbilical girth the length the height and so on maybe those should be used to also estimate 
the um, the body weight, right? And so that's what the linear model gives us. And it's you've probably seen the linear model before, maybe in the form of simple linear regression, which is what we'll be starting with. Okay, um, the linear model just kind of generalizes that to include more than one variable, uh, more than one ex explanatory variable. So up till now we've been basically looking at um, how how means change by group, right? But we can also have means change by a numeric measure, okay? And so the key concept with the linear model is we see how the mean outcome changes when other variables change, okay? Right, so the um, data set we're going to use is our Moroccan donkeys. So we have the sex, we've got age, body weight, heart girth, umbilical girth, length and height. The primary thing we want to estimate is body weight, because weighing donkeys requires a set of donkey scales. And donkey scales aren't exactly portable. Whereas measuring a donkey's height, or their heart girth, or umbilical girth, just needs a tape measure. And that is very portable. So if you can show that there's a relationship between these things, and we can kind of write down a formula that links them together, then we can just measure the, the measurements that are easy in the, to do in the field, and we can estimate what the weight is um, of that donkey by plugging it into some equation, right? And so, um, as you would expect, there's relationships between the body weight and um, each of the uh, measurement variables. So we've got measures of um, the circumference at the, at the heart, the girth at the heart, the girth at the umbilicus, um, the height of the donkey, and the length of the donkey, right? We've got these measures. And they all increase um, body weight um, as, as those measures increase, as you would expect, right? As the doggy, donkey gets bigger, its body weight increases, right? Um, we've also got other variables, so we've got sex and age as well. Um, we notice that when we look at sex, it's very hard to see any difference. And in lab six, we tested that and, and, and showed that there was no difference. In fact, as we'll see later on, sex does in fact play an important role. So there's reasonable, reasonably strong increasing relationships between body weight and heart girth, umbilical girth, length and height. Not much of a um, going on with sex. The strongest relationship is with heart girth. So what do I mean by that? Let's go back and have a look. So what I mean by a strong relationship is that the points are tightly clustered around the trend. Okay. Um, so that once you know the heart girth, there's a very restricted range of potential uh, weights, right? Before you measure heart girth, the weight could be anywhere between 50 and 220 or 230 kilos. Big range. But once you know the heart girth is, say, 120, then it's actually reduced quite a bit to a very, very small range, right? Um, it happens more with heart girth than it does with the others, right? You've got a much broader range because there's more spread, more scatter of the points around the trend. So a strong relationship is one where the points follow the trend really closely. We'll look into a measure for this later. Okay, so what if we wanted to do a hypothesis test about this? So what if we, um, you know, what if we wanted to test whether, um, statistically test whether the body weight changed um, as the heart girth changes? Okay, then, um, you know, when we looked at um, whether the uh, whether the right, right wing length differed between the male and female petrol birds, um, our hypothesis was that they didn't differ, right? It was the do nothing state, and then we compare our data with the do nothing state and see kind of how extreme our data is, right? We see a difference in our data. How extreme is that difference given what you'd expect from sampling? Well, let's think about what would happen if there was no relationship between heart girth and body weight. What would the graph look like if that hypothesis holds? What might we use as a suitable test statistic and what would we expect that test statistic to look like? So this is what we might think it might look like if the body weight had nothing to do with heart girth, right? We wouldn't expect to be able to see a trend on the plot. It would just be kind of a big blob of points. And if you tried to kind of fit a, fit a, a straight line relationship through these, it would just be flat, right? because knowing the heart girth doesn't tell you anything about body weight. So that's kind of what we'd expect if there was nothing going on. And as I said, when we fit straight lines to each of those, um, then we tend to get very flat 
straight lines, right? Sometimes they're going up a little bit, sometimes they're going down a little bit. Um, but on average, they're flat. The slope is zero, right? And so that's essentially what happens when we do a hypothesis test, right? We think about the do-nothing hypothesis, nothing is going on, and we think, well, what would we expect our sample to look like if nothing was going on? Well, it might look like these situations where sometimes we get a positive sample and sometimes we get a slightly negative slope, um, but on the, on the average, the slope will be zero. And if we plot what the expected slope is, right, so I've just taken those previous plots and I've put them on a histogram along with a whole bunch more um, examples, and the expected slope is zero, and has some nice sort of normal distribution around it. Okay, it's not perfectly normal, um, but normalish, right? So we expect the slope to be zero, but it might sometimes be negative and sometimes be positive. So there's some uncertainty around that, okay? Just due to the sampling process. And so we could compare what we expect might happen if nothing was going on with what happened in our data, right? So this is what we expect if there was no relationship between body weight and heart girth. This is what we found. Now there's a pretty clear difference there, isn't there, right? We've got a clear increasing trend and we could compare our expected slope, the one that we would expect if the hypothesis was true uh, um, and there was no relationship to what we observed in our sample where clearly there was a relationship. And you can see that our observed slope is very different to what our expected slope would be if there was nothing going on. Therefore, our data are very inconsistent with the hypothesis of no relationship, which is good because fairly clearly we could see a very strong relationship, right? Common sense is telling us there's something going on here. And fortunately, statistical sense is also telling us the same thing. Right, so um, our conclu so to assess whether there's a relationship between variables, we can compute the slope, right? If a straight line relationship makes sense, okay? Um, if no relationship holds, we would expect the slope to be zero. So we'd expect the slope in our sample to be close to zero if it's consistent with the hypothesis, right? Maybe it'll be, you know, a little bit positive or a little bit negative, but it's gonna be close to zero. In our example here, the data look nothing like we'd expect if there was no relationship. The slope is really far away from what we'd expect. It's a strong positive slope. So our p-value will be tiny, right? Because it's highly unlikely that this extreme value came from this distribution, right? The probability of that happening will be minuscule, okay? We can do this process using the LM function in R. So LM is short for linear model, and so it's fitting a straight line relationship, and then we can use a summary in order to get our p-values and things. So here's how we do it in RStudio, okay? LM is the function that we use, short for linear model. We then have a formula for specifying how the outcome variable should relate to the explanatory variable. So we're saying that body weight in terms of heart youth, that's the tilde again, same as what we use for t.test. Um, there's our donkey data. Okay, and what that does is it computes, is it kind of fits that straight line relationship, right? And estimates everything it needs to do. The summary function then gives us this, all of this output here, and the main thing we're looking for here is, here's our slope, 2.83, and there's its p-value. Right, less than 2 times 10 to the power of minus 16. So that's 15 zeros. So decimal point, 15 zeros, and then a 2. Right, so huge amounts of evidence against the hypothesis that there's nothing, no relationship between body weight and heart girth. Therefore, our conclusion would be that there is a relationship between body weight and heart girth. We'll look into um, this in more detail in the labs and lectures coming up.